Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And we're back. We're live. We are young talents making way on here on FinTech Hawaii. I'm Andrea Gabrielli. I'm your host. And every Tuesday, we keep an eye on the future with our most brilliant school students as we talk about their science projects. But you know, to understand the future and even the present, sometime we need to look at the past. But what if the past is primordial, such as the origin of the solar system and even our planet? Apparently, a meteorite has a lot to say about this. And so joining me today is Chloe Kalani from Mililani High School. Nice to have you here, Chloe. Nice to have you thank here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And, and we also thank uh, uh, Tyson Kikugawa, physics teacher at Mililani High School, and uh, Elizabeth um, Kumin Shields, who are here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> so Chloe, um, what does a meteorite tell you? What, 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 what sort of stories can it tell us? So meteorites act as like time capsules for scientists to look back on, and what they can tell us because they're um, they're about 4.56 billion years old, at least in the case of chondrites, wow. is that um, the different processes that happened within the solar system and even outside of the solar system um, that we can observe and look at. Wow, where, where, where can we find them? They are uh, in the solar system. In a, are they in a specific region of the solar system? So uh, the specific uh, meteorite that I studied, chondrites, come from S-class asteroids, and then they're broken down over time. And then as they go through the Earth's atmosphere, they, they create their fusion. They burn, such as yeah. the one we're, we're looking at behind us, yeah. <laughs> um, so um, maybe um, let's have our first slide up so you can tell us something about uh, the, what you did as part of your science project. So look at that. <laughs> what are we looking at here? So the first picture is a picture of my uh, wonderful mentor, she, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kuman Shields. She really helped me throughout this entire process um, with the using the instruments and helping me uh, find uh, clarifying information, helping with the, me with the data. The next picture on the top row in the middle is a picture yeah. of the inside chamber of the uh, SCM EDS, or the Scanning Electron Microscope. This couple. is one of the sensors that you have used as part of your project. Yes. Yeah, OK. And then the right is a picture of the, the sample that I used. Oh, OK. It was called the uh, H6 Ordinary Chondrite Butsura. Yeah. The bottom left picture is a picture of um, how we got to set up the sample on the uh, specimen plate. This is this like, that's right, it looks like a plate and yeah. so, yeah, okay. And then, so that was inserted inside of the uh, SCM. Yeah. And then we can look at it from there. That's the stage that moves. That's so right, you, okay. So you can look at it. And then the last picture is a picture of me on the um, SCM EDS using the NSS spectral software. Wow, okay. And looking at sample areas. So you are sitting in front of the computer and everything, yeah. Okay, so um, this is a, a, a meteorite can tell us a lot about uh, the origin of the solar system and, uh, um, and as part of your project, uh, I understand that you um, took this particular meteorite, which is called a chondrite, mm -hmm. and you studied it um, um, using uh, what? What did you use? So I. I um, tested with the scanning electron microscope with coupled with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, and I compared that data to two previous studies using the inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, which is the these IPP. Are, these <laughs> are really yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have some some pictures to explain what these uh, complicated sensors really are. Yeah. Which is the ICPMS, and then the electron probe microanalyzer, which is the EPMA. Okay, um, let's have our next slide up so we can see um, something about. Uh, uh, okay, so this is a this is a, um, a figure that illustrates, uh, uh, I guess, the different types, types of, of meteorites. Meteor. Yeah. So the highlighted sections um, yeah. are the the class I specifically focused on. So um, under the undifferentiated meteorites are the main ca class of chondrites, and then under there there's many different types of chondrites. I focus primarily on the ordinary chondrites, which break into HL and LL, which are um, describe the type, the composition. So H chondrites are mainly composed of heavy metals like magnesium and iron. Mm, okay, okay. 
So you, you focus on these heavy metals for this particular class of meteorites. All right. Um, let's have our, our next slide up so we can see. Uh, OK, so these are the three um, complicated uh, sensors that you mentioned earlier. So what are the, um, what can you tell us about these three particular sensors? Yeah. OK, so the left picture is a picture of the ICPMS, or the inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer. And mainly what uh, happens is that the sample of the meteorite is dissolved in acid and introduced to the interface as a aerosol or a liquid. And so is it, uh, does that mean that the sample is destroyed? It means it's destroyed. Oh, wow. So you, you can't get that sample back. So we, we can't uh, do any more uh, studying on that particular sample, because once we run the, the sensor, it's gone forever. Yes. Yeah, OK. Um, what about the, 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 the one we're looking in the center? The center is the scanning electron microscope with energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. Um, that is a non-destructive method. It uses the um, idea of secondary electrons with a, a primary beam, which makes contact with the sample. And basically, um, through that process, it emits a X-ray, a unique X-ray photon for each element. And then the EDS is able to pick up and determine the chemical composition. Oh, OK, yeah. And um, so we're looking at, th there is a third one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the. Um, uh, electron probe microanalyzer, or the EPMA. Um, as you can see in the picture, the SEM and EPMA actually look pretty similar. Mm. Um, but the, the difference with the EPMA is that it utilizes um, WDS, or wavelength dispersive spectroscopy, which is just a different principle than the e EDS. OK, so um, why did you consider uh, these three sensors, uh, you, you wanted to measure uh, the sensitivity of each of these sensors. Uh, um, and also, um, why did you actually um, choose these sensors? Well, all three sensors are commonly used to, um, to determine the chemical composition of meteorites. But they're all used for um, many different purposes. So. I, I basically looked at the weaknesses and the strength of all three of them. Yeah. So all the, the strength of ICPMS is that it's, it has very high detection limits. So you can basically guarantee, not guarantee, but basically uh, um, trust the data that you're getting from it that it would be valid with a very high um, accuracy. Yeah. And then same with the EPMA. However, with the uh, ICPMS, you have to destroy the sample. That's so, right, which is yeah. not <laughs> convenient. Which uh, is okay. not very ideal, considering yeah. that meteorites, you know, you don't have a lot of them in, in, um, in hand. So uh, the weakness of the uh, EPMA is that it's very time consuming. It, it requires a lot of um, calibration for each of the wavelength that you want to find. So it's not a very easy process to use. OK. Um, however, the SCM addresses both of those issues. It's it's a non-destructive technique, which means you don't have to destroy the sample. And it's a, it's a quick quali qualitative analysis because it uses the, the standard list peaks of the EDS. But because it's standard list, we don't really know the uh, precision of the data that we're getting back from it. OK, and so this is why you decided to see, OK, these sensors. Wow, OK. So um, this idea of uh, um, carrying out this research to see what each sen what the limitations and strengths of each of these sensors mm -hmm. came from uh, an event which you attended, I believe. Yes, um, last year during the summer, yeah. I attended a, a astronomy program called High Star, mm. uh, held at UH, and then um, so it's basically a camp that taught us like the astronomy basics. But um, what we did within that program is we did a smaller group project. And then I was partnered with um, my current mentor, Elizabeth Kuhn Shields. Yeah. And then um, we did a small scale project where we got to work on the SEM EDS looking at um, simply. This particular sensor, yeah? This, yeah. Um, simply um, just trying to identify different types of meteorites. And then from there, I noticed that the, the data we were getting back from the SEM EDS didn't match the the data that we were supposed to be getting right. as part of just a small activity. And then I started to really question, is this a really precise way of getting our, our um, chemical analyses? In these meteorites. Mm -hmm. 
That's amazing because uh, by basically uh, being able to work with uh, professional researchers, you came up with you know new uh, research idea and then you carried out this project. And uh, also you got um, uh, some help as well for for this uh, for this particular project. And 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 this is what brought you to the state of Hawaii Science and Engineering Fair. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's really, you know, it, it's wonderful when you get to work with professionals and you can really see what they do and what they, um, they study. Uh, let's have our next uh, slide up so we can see um, more about this project that, that you did. Okay, so this is, uh, this looks like... Uh, so this uh, is the uh, sample that I looked at. It's a H6 ordinary chondrite but sura. Um, this is just under a normal light microscope. Uh, and then so it's a piece of rock that was uh, in space orbiting the sun. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, uh, uh, and how do you get these these, these meteorites? Uh, because you you mentioned there is not a lot of them. Uh, how did you get uh, this particular sample? So uh, I was uh, graciously <laughs> allowed <laughs> access to the UH's. Um, I guess collection of meteorites. Of, mine of meteorites, yeah. And then my uh, mentor was able to provide me a sample. The actual sample, wow, okay. And then um, I'd just like to address that in the picture it looks really big, but in real life that was about uh, half a centimeter. <laughs> Wow, okay, so Very tiny, small. tiny sample, okay, okay. Um, let's see some more, some more slides that you brought us today. Um, okay, so what are we looking at here? So this is what I would be seeing on the interface of the, uh, of the computer when I was using the SEM EDS. Yeah. The three, um, the top row and then the left picture are pictures of the um, sample areas that I looked at. Under um, it's it's under a mode called backscatter electron, so that displays all the different grays and whites. The white areas are areas of high metals, so you would see mostly magnesium and iron there. That's the heavy metal that you mentioned earlier. Okay, yeah. And then the darker areas are all mostly silicates. Silicates, okay. So like silicon and stuff like that. Well, the bottom right picture would be how I set up each point analysis. So I set up in a five by five grid, about 50 microns apart from each other. So these are the blue uh, symbols that were yes. that you put over this picture. Yeah. Okay. The the blue symbols. So I took about 25 per each um, sample area. Okay. And I repeated this about 75 times to get over 2,000 points. Wow. Okay. How long did it take to uh, did it take you to complete this analysis? Mm. Basically, about you know, weeks or. Once or twice a week for about six hours for two months. Wow. Okay, so this is a lot of, you know, work and time that you had to, okay, wow, okay, okay. Um, let's see some, some, let's see some more um, slides. Uh, okay, so this is, these are your um, results, some graphs. That so this would be the, the raw data. Okay. <laughs> say. Um, so uh, each of those points that you saw, the blue points, Yeah. Uh, the gra one graph corresponds to each of those one points. So th this would be the peak analysis. It counts the um, amount. It's a it counts the amount of peaks of each element, and then from there it can um, the software is able to determine the weight percentage. So here each peak basically represents a particular mineral or element that you can find in, into this min into yes. this meteorite. Okay. Okay. Wow. So um, we're really learning uh, uh, a lot about uh, the stories that a meteorite can tell us and this research that you carried out comparing uh, uh, three particular sensors to, you know, uh, get these stories. And so uh, now it is time to take a break, but we're going to be back soon to learn more about uh, this amazing uh, um, meteorites and particles of rocks that you can find uh, in the solar system system with, with Chloe Kalani here at Young Talents Making Way on FinTech Hawaii. We'll be back soon. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I'm the host of FinTech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, 
going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance, not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Good afternoon, my name is Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green, a program on Think Tech Hawaii. We show at three o'clock in the afternoon every other Monday. My guests are specialists, both from here and the mainland on energy efficiency, which means you do more for less electricity and you're generally safer and more comfortable while you're keeping dollars in your pocket. And we're back, we're live. We are Young Talents Making Way here on FinTech Hawaii. And today we're talking about meteorites with Chloe Kalani from Mililani High School. Thank you for Thank being you. with us today. Thank you. Um, so this um, experiment, you selected this particular uh, class of meteorites called chondrites. So you got a sample and you um, compared uh, um, what Three uh, sensors can tell us about uh, this particular uh, sample. Um, so, uh, what have you learned uh, as part of this uh, project? Like personal? No, no, uh, about the about the, the meteorite, oh, oh, about okay. the, the three sensors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so overall, the overall conclusion was that SEM EDS is a feasible method for looking at major elements, which are the elements that make up the bulk of the sample. However, when you want to look at trace elements or elements that are below um, 1,000 parts per million, there, it's really not um, an ideal method for look, to, to look at those um, elements. You would want to more go towards the ICPMS or the EPMA. Um, um, another interesting an, like finding I found was that the uh, SCM EDS didn't for major elements didn't tend to overestimate or underestimate any of the um, elements that I looked at. They were all um, nicely in the middle between the EPMA and the ICPMS ranges. Um, looking at the trace elements, uh, the SCM EDS data was nowhere. Um, if you look at the let, let's see some let, let's see some more slides so you can tell us more about these results. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let, let's see the next one. Okay. Uh, so um, yeah, these are the major elements and the, the trace, trace the trace elements you're mentioning about. The yeah. Graphs. Okay. Let's see. Um, the next one, yeah, okay. So here. Mm -hmm. So this would be an example of a, a, a major element I sampled. This would be a silicon. The silicon, yeah. So the red line would represent the ICPMS, which would be the upper bound of my range. The blue line would be the EPMA, which is the lower. Yeah. And then the SEM, you can see, is just in the middle between both of them. And that was normally the trend for all of my major elements. Okay. So, um, since typically the ICPMS or the EPMA are accepted values of the, EP, of the meteorite composition, you could um, determine that SEM EDS would be feasible for looking at major elements. This is amazing that you had this idea of actually um, comparing these three sensors, considering one destroys the sample. And so it's not very good to carry out research or something. The other one takes forever. It is very long yeah. to, to actually uh, carry out these um, this studies. And the third one is the one that you actually uh, came up with this idea of you know, testing and see what, uh, how, what, what kind of analysis, the precision as well, for these sensors can, can, uh, can, can see. Um, so you went um, to the uh, State of Hawaii Science and Engineering Fair with this uh, uh, project, with this idea. How was, uh, how was it? What kind of experience uh, uh, personally uh, have you gained uh, over there? Well, uh, I attended districts. Um, and then from there, uh, it, was, it was really fun just trying to explain the project to a lot of other people, um, especially like the, the judges and the, just the normal um, uh, observers. All the answer does as well. Uh, and, this is, and this is something very interesting because it's something that could also be, um, could also, uh, could, could this process, your idea of using this particular sensor to look at meteorites without uh, taking forever and destroying the sample, could it be used for other purposes as well? For maybe some forensic analysis or? Well, yeah. uh, the SEM EDS is um, also widely used in a lot of other 
uh, fields like forensics and meteor, uh, not meteorites, uh, meteorites as well. But, meteorites um, as well, yeah. Material science. As you proved, material science. And then um, like food science. So, wow. Um, so a lot of potential applications yeah. as well. Wow, okay. Okay, so why, uh, why did you get uh, passionate about uh, uh, meteorites and stars and these particular sensors? Well, uh, I've always really had an interest in like geology mm. and astronomy. So meteorites were like a nice combination of the two. You put them together, wow, okay. So like to understand the, the characteristics of the meteorite and the different components that go into it, it requires like, you know, understanding chemistry and geology and all those things. But um, understanding what it means in a larger context to the universe, you would have to understand astronomy. So I, I thought it was a really nice balance between them both. It's amazing, it, it really is, it really is. And um, um, I understand that um, as part of your, um, you know, duties uh, at Mililani High School, you also are the president uh, yeah. of the science club at yeah. Mililani High School. Wow. So, uh, what kind of activities do you do uh, as part of this, uh, as part of this um, club uh, at, at, at your school? So, the main thing that um, the Mililani Science Club participates in is a competition known as a Science Olympiad. Wow. It's a, it's a national competition, but uh, so far we compete statewide. Um, it's basically like an Olympics for many different types of branches of science. For science, Olympics of science. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah. And then, so as a club, we compete as a team, but each individual um, competes in a different event in okay. a different branch of science. So do you do meteorites? <laughs> so my event would be uh, rocks and minerals. And rocks and minerals. Astronomy. And astronomy as yes. well. Okay. So this is um, another event uh, which is other than the state of Hawaii Science and Engineering yes. Fair. So we can see that Mililani High School is really involved with all these uh, this activities and everything. Uh, how often do you meet with this science club uh, at, uh, at Mililani High School? So competition season normally would start around September. Yeah. So from there on, we would meet about once or twice every two weeks, just um, going over you know general information as well as we have study sessions every Saturday from eight to twelve. Eight to twelve. Okay. So yeah. that's a. I mean, it's a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Where we just come in and like review the concepts or um, study for the tests or um, test. How does, that, because we are familiar with the state of Hawaii Science and Engineering Fair and its rules with district fairs and everything, but how does this work? How is, the, um, how the, is this competition um, carried out? So, um, <laughs> we're competing against other schools. So, so every school has a science club, and so? So, um, we would, so uh, it would usually take place on a whole day, wow. and then, um, so we would have a schedule that each event, like let's say, um, there are like 15 different events. Mm. So um, each person would just go into their designated place and then do the, um, take the, the test or do the lab. The test and the lab. So you mentioned um, you're doing uh, minerals and rocks mm -hmm. for this geological um, point of view. Uh, what are other areas of science? Uh, do you do you have students that you know carry out projects for this uh, competition? All, all different kinds. Like um, there's a chemistry event. There's a um, looking at cell biology. There's um, epidemiology. There's wow. Many different kinds. Um, um, what I'm. What I'm, okay. Uh, <laughs> all different branches material of science, science. M material science as well. Yeah. So, um, what, um, do you have? Uh, uh, so obviously, you are passionate about this uh, geology and astronomy. So rocks that you can find in space, these mm -hmm. meteorites, uh, these chondrites. Uh, do you have an idea of what you might uh, uh, see yourself in the future? What might be your, you know? future aspirations or something. We're curious here at Think Tech Hawaii. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure what major I would want to go into, but I definitely would want to go into a science field, go to a college. Into <laughs> science, uh, science as well. Wow, okay, okay. That's very nice. Um, so, 
Um, maybe um, we have some time for some more slides that you brought us here today. We can see these are um, still more of the uh, magnesium and the um, elements that we uh, showed. L let's have our next slide up. Uh, okay, so this is the um, the, the trace elements. The trace elements. Yeah. So we mentioned we mentioned this before, but what are they? Trace elements are um, my operational definition of trace elements were all elements that were below 1,000 parts per million yeah. or 0 0.1 uh, weight percentage. So they are elements that are present, but they are very, very small. Very, very rare. OK, OK. Um, we have uh, uh, about uh, uh, one minute left <laughs> in this conversation today. Um, could you uh, summarize a little bit um, for us what you did as part of this project and the importance of it? So I analyzed the chemical um, elemental composition of a, a meteorite using three different types of instruments, the ICPMS, the EPMA, and the SEM-EDS. And basically what I found was that the SEM EDS is a feasible method of looking at um, major elements, however not trace elements. And the trace elements, yeah. Therefore, if you would like to have a fast and non-destructive uh, method of testing, uh, SEM is the way to go. However, if you want to look at more in depth and look at trace elements, the ICPMS or the EPMA may be more uh, beneficial to you. And um, it's important because Meteorites are are like rare time capsules for us to look at. So um, if we want to look back at processes of the universe or the solar system, they um, they would be one of your only available specimens to observe. Tools to see. Wow. Thank you so much for coming to us today, Chloe. Thank you. And we thank also our audience. And this is Young Talents Making Way only here on FinTech Hawaii. Next Tuesday at 11 a.m., we will be back for more. Stay tuned.